Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, about all I know about growing things, I suppose I learned in kindergarten by poking a, a finger into a small paper cup filled with black dirt and then dropping in a bean seed, covering it up, adding water, and then putting it on the windowsill to catch some sunlight. Before long, a green shoot popped up and voila, I was a farmer. <laughs> My scientific conclusion, God made it grow. There's lots of science, though, behind what actually happens in germination. Stuff that includes metabolic processes and cell growth and embryos and enzymes. Processes that include terms like imbibition and hydrolytic enzymes and aerobic respiration and phytotoxicity and vernalization, abscisic acid and something called gibberlin. But all that science still won't work without important external factors like water and warmth and light. So I don't care how many big words you use to describe the process, God still makes it grow because God made all those things and God made the seeds. In our gospel lesson this morning, Jesus compares the kingdom of God to seeds scattered on the ground that then sprouts and grows and when fully ripe, gets harvested. In the story he tells, the man scattering the seed doesn't ever really have a clue about the science of it all. He just knows that the seed's going to do what seed does. Right? Uh, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear, and finally it'll be ready for the harvest. Now when Jesus tells a story like this, you have to think to yourself that there's, there's really something else going on than a lesson in farming. This lesson was vital for first century Christians who are going to need it long after Jesus is no longer with them. It's also a lesson for all of us who are trying to do church today in what, what's really being called the post-Christian world. Post-Christian. I hope we would agree that it's more important than ever to, to share our faith with others along with the reason for that hope we have while there's still time. You know, time for us to share and time for others to hear. And that's in spite of the fact that we really might not understand the ins and outs about how exactly the Holy Spirit takes that shared word or that shared story and germinates it into a new faith. Just knowing that he does is reason enough. Now the person scattering seed in Jesus' story doesn't really know how it all works either. He simply does his part as best he can and, and trusts that a harvest will come from it. He doesn't really know how, but he knows from experience that it does. He knows that if the seed just sits in the seed bag, that it'll never have a chance of reaching its God-given potential. Now, the early believers risking their life to scatter, scatter the seeds of the gospel in the midst of persecution would recall how Jesus had told them about the growth of the kingdom and how it would proceed according to God's plan, even when it was starting to look like a season of drought. They didn't know that when the crop, when the crop would ripen either, but they could trust that, you know, in God's time, it would be ready for the harvest. And so they lived with an unfailing hope, what we call a sure hope, which really isn't a hope at all, is it? We've just come out of kind of a drought time ourselves. A lot of people get out of the habit of going, church, going to church when churches were forced to close during the pandemic. Now, we moved to online worship during the gap, but a lot of churches didn't. Um, people really weren't feeling very pressured to go to church already before the pandemic. And now they weren't even being nudged to at least check it out virtually. And so they didn't. Well, now we're back. And our gospel lesson this morning is a reminder of what we're all about, planting seeds. But not just out there. You know, even among Christians, life tends to, to hand them the kind of struggles that'll uh, wilt the seedlings or suck the life out of what was once uh, a vibrant plant. Because we're just coming out of a time that saw many churches struggling, people might get pessimistic about its future, wondering if this year's crop is going to fail or if the Seeds of faith that were planted during the pandemic still have a chance of actually germinating and taking root and growing. But the, the church, capital C church, the overall big picture church of Christianity, listen, dying. We've lived for a long time now in an, envir in an environment that was hostile to our message. And not being here in person for over a year really hasn't helped our cause. But this isn't the time to despair. I have to look at it like a time of new beginnings, time of promise time of great opportunities. We know that there's a growing number of people referred to by pollsters as the nuns. These are the people who check that box when they're asked about what religion they identify with. 
But even those people are really just opportunities. But we Christians, you know, you know, we're not all exactly what you might call frontline workers. There are several different categories of believers that fall under the, the big umbrella called Christian. Uh, there are Christians who identify as believers simply because the culture tells them they are. These are the ones who, uh, uh, you know, believe in name only, I guess you could say. They don't really practice um, what you might call a vibrant faith. They become disconnected from a local congregation. They exist on the fringes of faith. You probably know some. The ones who claim they believe, but they don't like the church as an institution. And who's going to criticize them for not going to church when practically everybody they know aren't going to church? It's time to wake them up from their hibernation, to get them back into worship and active again. Back to receiving God's means of grace, his word, his sacraments. Hearing for themselves, in person, God's sweet words of forgiveness and unconditional love. Love that demands a response simply because it's so powerful. Then there are the Christians who do have some connection to an actual congregational life, but only attend occasionally. You know, it seems like, like something comes up that prevents them from giving God just an hour or so a week. Because they let it. And then there are those Christians who actually live according to their faith. These are the people who would say that they've met Jesus and that he's changed their lives and that now their lives are, are centered around their faith in him. You know, the church coming out of exile in, is, is in, in danger of losing those fringe believers. We're not in danger of losing the ones who are active in the faith and who have remained active throughout the pandemic. We're in danger of losing the ones around the edges that, that never work. Um, we have great seed. And our number one job is to keep on scattering that seed. But we also need to remember to nurture the seedlings. God said this about the gospel through the prophet Isaiah. He said, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That's some powerful seed, isn't it? You know, and it must have been a great comfort to the apostles who had to head out into the world with it after the crucified and risen Jesus return to heaven. The Apostle Paul would later say this about, about the scattering. He said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, God made it grow. Outreach and even inreach is a, clearly a group effort. And we all have a role to play as God's instruments in, in seeing a fruitful harvest. There's also something called an empty seed. It's one that will never germinate and grow. The, the ingredients needed just aren't there. Metaphorically, these might be the, the religious groups claiming to be Christian, but you know, at their very core, their very root, they don't have Jesus right as true God and true man, the second person of our Trinitarian God. They might believe that Jesus was just a man, or they might believe he was a prophet or a great teacher, but not God. Or some even believe he might have been one God among many gods, but not all those options. All of them miss the mark. If you don't have Jesus right, you're working with empty seed. First of all, an ordinary man could never have died for the sins of the whole world. Maybe for his own sins he could have died, but not for your sins or for mine. That Jesus has no potential for salvation. Now, it might make sense to a person's common sense, but the one who makes the seed grow is so much more. We have great seed. We have a great message to share. The best news ever. One that can change lives by offering life and light and hope to people. The seed we scatter every time we share what Christ means to us has the power to rescue someone from eternal separation from God. Think about that. And from that moment on, God does all the heavy lifting. Our message is that God is holy and he's perfect and without sin. That he hates sin but loves his children and wants all of them to be with him forever. But sin separates us from God. It creates a, a kind of a gulf between us. And it's, a, it's, you know, like one wrong thing you did or one, one thing you should have done that you didn't do, and bam, we find ourselves standing on one side of the gulf and God on the other side. And there's nothing we can do to, to span that gap on our own, not our own efforts, not our own good works, not our own philanthropy. But God has never stopped loving us, and so he spanned it for us. He built a bridge in the shape of a cross. A cross on which his son Jesus took our sins and condemnation that we deserve for those sins on himself when he shed his own innocent blood there. Faith is really access to that bridge. 
Faith is a gift of God that's offered to everyone. It's his miracle to work in, and he will. But people also have a choice not to accept it. So like the man in Jesus' parable, we have to just keep on scattering that good seed. God works the miracle of new growth. If we do our job, we don't have to worry about whether or not God will do his. We just have to do ours the best we can and then like, leave the germinating up to him. But in light of that thought, let's look at a few ways we can make it a little harder for God to turn hearts to Jesus. Things that some people have done that thinking they're lending God a hand when the truth is probably help we'd rather not have had. See, you can stand on a corner and shout repent to every car that goes by. Could, but if it didn't work for the prophet Jeremiah, it's probably not going to work for you. You can wear a t-shirt, same t-shirt every day that says, ready to die, ask me why. They'll scare people if that's what you're after. They'll probably scare them away from you. You can put gospel tracts into the hands of mannequins at the mall. Well, it looks like the fashion dummy is offering the tract. It'll be the real dummy who gets thrown out of the place. Displaying any kind of Christian bumper sticker or emblem on your car is probably a bad idea. If you're a bad driver, maybe there's a better way. You know, maybe, maybe we should learn to speak the unbeliever's language instead. We use a lot of code words in church. Words like atonement, justification, propitiation, glorification, sanctification. What do these things even mean to someone who's never been to church except on Christmas and Easter because a friend or a loved one dragged them there? It's gibberish. Like comedian Steve Martin once said, those French people, it's like they have a different word for everything. <laughs> well, you know, those Christians, we have a different word for a lot of things too. Want to be a friend? Be a translator. Be a translator. God's word was translated from ancient text. None of it was English. By the way, propitiation means that Christ became the object of God's wrath for us. But to tell someone that the result of his propitiation was the expiation of all our sins, who talks like that? Keep it simple. Keep it comprehensible while still being faithful to God's word. There is a God, and that God is holy, and that God is just. Not being holy like God comes with a cost. There's always a price to be paid for sin. And so, because uh, he loves us so, even though he, we continue to sin, God sent his own son, Jesus, to pay that price for us in our place, even though he never sinned. That's it. Salvation isn't hard, at least for us. So learning about it shouldn't be hard either. You should also try to understand the unbeliever's world. You know, you've got a pretty good idea what people are taught, being taught today about right or wrong and life in public schools and secular universities these days. Christians aren't the only ones who hold things sacred. But we might be miles apart when it comes to just what those things are. You know, understand your friend's re previous religious experience and, and their cultural background. Listen to them. Listen to them. Listen for commonalities between your world and theirs. That's always a great place to begin. That's common ground where a seed will have a chance to grow. Avoid cliches. Non-Christians don't want to hear them, and they'll shut you off in a heartbeat when they do. They will. A couple of examples. They might surprise you. You say, everything happens for a reason. That's not even in the Bible. Now, there's a time or to everything there is a season. That's in there, but it doesn't mean the same thing, does it? Do you want to say that to someone who's been assaulted or molested or has just lost a loved one to a tragic accident or a terrible disease, that everything happens for a reason? Do you really mean to say to God that, that God had a plan or say that God had a plan for this that, that was going to happen to him and a reason it happened to them? Because that's what they're going to hear. Of course you do. You're not trying to hurt them. You're trying to comfort them. Now, we know that what God did say was that when hard times come, He'll walk through them with us. All we have to do is just lean on him. He'll be our strength. Or how about this one? Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you seriously think you can force someone to believe by backing them into a corner? Think about it. What does the whole concept of Lord mean to someone today? It sounds medieval. A lot of conversation has to happen before you get around to the concept of Jesus as Lord or even Savior. 
And by the time that happens, it'll probably make sense, but maybe not your best opening line. What about Jesus died for your sins? Again, absolutely 100% true and an all-time Christian favorite and central to the gospel. But save it for someone who realizes that they're a sinner or comes to grips with the truth that there's even something left that might be called sin in a, in a world with so few moral boundaries. Until a person understands that there's a whole bigger picture to life just beyond this life, they'll never understand the concept of sin and forgiveness and redemption. So slow down. Take your time. Be a good listener. Timing is everything. One more. When God closes a door, he opens a window. Now you might have a grip on this as a good thing, but to someone who isn't where you are, it sounds like whenever something unexpected and usually bad uh, happens to a person, uh, God did it. It's well-meaning, but sometimes it might not be helpful. Someone who's feeling like a door to hope just got slammed in their face isn't going to want to be told something that sounds to them like God slammed it. Makes sense? Not so easy being a farmer, is it? You know, you wouldn't sow seed in the weeds. And sometimes the weeds is us. You know, we don't have to reinvent the faith. God's got that pretty much handled already. It's awesome, just like it is. But we might need to te tweak the church a little bit in order to get the message of faith's benefit out into an ever-changing culture. Now, not what we believe. Not what the Bible says about sin and salvation. But maybe instead of just doing church, we need to start being the church. In here and out there. Because to all those people who aren't in here this morning, as much as 80% of America, according to some surveys that actually counted people in the seats back before the pandemic, you and I, we're going to be the church to them. I guess the bottom line is that in all this sowing and planting, there's, you know, no worries. The harvest isn't failing. The Lord of the harvest will see to that. He's got our backs. We can sow with confidence and with anticipation and with joy. The growth will happen. The harvest will come because God is love and God is good. Amen. Now may that very special peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Why don't we take a moment to uh, confess our Christian faith together. We'll do it on this communion Sunday in the words of the Nicene Creed.